when I was in primary school in the 90s, teachers were telling me that adults had stuffed things up and that you kids would be fixing it. Now there are teachers my age telling kids that we've stuffed it up and that they'd be fixing it. That's really difficult to think about. I do share the concerns of young people about the future and what's going to happen to our planet. It's very hard to be a scientist working in this field where you see such profound changes in the Earth system and not be concerned about what might come next. Many adults remember the fear or the concern about, do we have the sex talk? Well, I think probably a lot of parents are wondering about the climate talk in the same kind of way. But actually, it's the students or the children who are asking the question of parents, what did you do in your lifetime about climate? What does my generation need to learn from your generation as to what not to do as much as what to do? We have really compelling evidence that extreme events are getting worse and that humans are responsible for those changes. Changing our whole economy and energy systems away from fossil fuels is this huge undertaking. But there's also opportunities that come from doing that. Human beings are changing the climate at 170 times the natural rate. And so what used to take 8,500 years now takes only 50 years. It's not about some linear progression of things gradually getting warmer. Climate change is about climate extremes. Climate change is kind of like a steamroller because it's moving so slowly in some ways, it almost feels like we can ignore it on a lovely spring day. But then uh, we see a fire or a flood or a heat wave and suddenly we can't ignore it anymore. We realise it's been there the whole time creeping up on us. It's very urgent that we act now to reduce the emissions as fast as possible for the sake of our future generations. It's the next generations that will bear the brunt of the hotter climate. In every realm of science, every group studying the impact of climate on ecosystems is finding that the impacts are happening sooner and stronger. I worked on Icelandic glaciers for my PhD and they're no longer there. I've worked in New Zealand. The glaciers have retreated dramatically there as well. All of that ice that is uh, melting away is going into the sea uh, and it's causing sea level rise. And glaciers are one of the largest contributors to sea level rise. Glacier changes are very strongly linked to human emissions of greenhouse gases, and we've only really learnt that over the last 10 years or so. I have a team that is investigating how the Antarctic ice sheet responds to climate change. Predicting what the ice sheet's going to do over the next century and beyond is actually very difficult. Part of the reason for that is that we don't know enough about Antarctica yet. We actually know much more about the surface of Mars than we do um, the bed underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. But if the entire Antarctic ice sheet was to melt, we would get more than 50 metres of sea level rise. Rising sea levels are inundating communities in small Pacific Island countries and in large Delta cities in South and East Asia. This is displacing people, and this has broad implications for not just their physical well-being, but also their mental well-being. The Lancet has concluded that climate change is the greatest health challenge of the 21st century. Extreme weather events are already harming health around the world. Here in Australia, in 2019, 2020, we had an extraordinary bushfire season. More than 400 people died from the smoke pollution. 
scientists are concerned that changing environmental conditions, climate change, biodiversity loss, habitat loss, is accelerating the frequency of spillover of novel pathogens like SARS-CoV-2 from wild animals to people. Children are particularly vulnerable to climate change. One important example is diarrheal disease, very common cause of health problems and death, and particularly in low-income countries. And the rates of diarrheal disease increase in the context of extreme weather events like floods. This is a great concern for future generations of young people around the world. What we're beginning to see, particularly since Greta appeared on the scene, is much more of an emphasis on the climate emergency. You see them in the school strikes, you see them in the social media spaces. I just love the energy of young people grappling with this, but calling out those perhaps in power who aren't acting as if this isn't going on right now. The new types of climate change education which are becoming really important are the shifts towards understanding what's happening to cultures, civilizations, the kind of emergency conditions. My generation of scientists, we mostly went into this field because we loved the wild places, the unexplored regions. We wanted to understand how they worked as a system. But a lot of young scientists coming into the field now are motivated by the climate crisis. They want to sort of understand what's happening so that they can um, do better for society. We know that students around the world are asking for a more relevant, authentic education which deals with current challenges, existential challenges, where they can see that their futures are disappearing because of the inaction which has happened, particularly since the Paris Agreement, but before then, when the COP processes started happening in the 1990s. The Paris Agreement in 2015, the world um, agreed to try and limit warming to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. The scientific research has indicated that trying to avoid going above two degrees will avoid the most dangerous impacts of climate change. If you overshoot 1.5 degrees, you're looking at, you know, what the world was like during the Eemian period, which is 118,000 years ago. That was a world of superstorms that were way beyond what we're seeing now, not compatible with human habitation. If we do continue at current rates of emission, we're headed towards three or four degrees global warming by the end of this century, and that is really indicating catastrophic changes in the climate. If you can have 10% of Australia's eucalypt forests completely burnt out at only 1.2 degrees over pre-industrial, imagine what could happen at three, four, five degrees. The UN and the IPC scientists have made very clear that burning fossil fuels is causing global warming. The UN has actually asked that all OECD countries phase out of coal by 2030. That's quite challenging for a country like Australia, where we still have our electricity grid being majority powered by coal. Our research shows that in Australia, we have the ability for technology to eliminate our emissions to net zero by 2035. The solutions are there, we've got to roll them out fast so that we can live the life as we currently live. We know that in a zero emissions economy, we can still fly planes and drive cars and have mining and manufacturing and live in the homes that we live in, provided we switch the energy sources to zero emissions energy and restore nature at the same time. Each industry and each company should be making net zero emissions plans for their own products and services and for their customers and for their supply chain. Overall, for Australia, the research shows we can have job increases in a zero emissions economy and we can replace our exports of LNG and coal with exports of green energy, particularly using green hydrogen. The top priorities are an urgent transition to renewable energy, to rethink our agri-food systems, to make them more sustainable, and to reimagine our cities so that we can live in our cities in more sustainable ways. If you price in health, and the health of future generations, 
renewables are way cheaper. They're unbelievably cheaper. Importantly, the transition to renewable energy will not just reduce carbon emissions from the burning of fossil fuels, but it'll also reduce toxic emissions, which cause respiratory and heart health problems. Every year, more than 7 million people die around the world as a result of the burning of fossil fuels. This is the critical decade for decarbonisation. We have a decade or two to really turn our emissions around and start cutting down and leaving carbon in the ground. And that there really is a stark choice between acting now to stop climate change and letting these impacts get worse. There are a lot of lessons from COVID for climate action. We saw how quickly we can adjust, that when governments and societies want to move, they can move. We know that the climate needs the same. It's not too late. I'm hopeful that we can still act urgently to tackle climate change. And young people around the world are inspiring to us all. They're really challenging our political leaders to get on with the job of action on climate change.